Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Chem 1211 with your host, me, Dr. White. All right, a couple important things. First of all, this Thursday, I will be giving test number one. How will I give it? On Wednesday, in the assignment area, you'll be able to download the PDF file and a periodic table, which you should use. You'll, it'll be the PDF file will be password protected. Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Thursday at about right after class, I'll send out an email with the password. And you'll have until Friday morning, 9 a.m. to upload it as a single PDF file. And I have put in Blackboard and I will put attached to a test number one assignment a file that tells you how to create a PDF file if you don't have a scanner. And you'll do the test. If you don't have a printer, just hand write out the answers. You don't have to hand write out the whole test. One of your colleagues last night in my office hour asked about calculators. Of course, you will need a calculator for test number one. So you obviously can use it. Now, next, I'm going to tell you up front, throughout the summer, there's been concern, not only at COD, but everywhere, about students taking tests at home and cheating. I have, if you haven't figured out by now, I'm a power user, and I put some things in the test to let me know if you're cheating. Please don't. I will do what's in my syllabus. Uh, you shouldn't be looking on the internet. You shouldn't have anybody helping you. You shouldn't have your notes out. And you shouldn't be looking at other things that you shouldn't be looking at. That's called cheating. Please don't. If I think students are, next test, I'll have to take more drastic measures. I'm trying not to this test. I'm going to also test if you will stay on your honor. And I hope you all do. Now, I already posted in uh, Blackboard test number one, how many problems, how many pages. It'll be 100 points. Uh, it'll cover chapters one through four. And later today, I'll do problem set four. If you can do the problem sets well, you're in good shape for the test. I will tell you this. Every question on my test, the concept behind it, I've covered at least twice, more than twice usually, in lecture here, which you can also see on YouTube. So that's available. All right. Uh, also, I don't like multiple choice, but on this test, I think I have seven one point multiple choice, but most of it is short answer or figure out something. It pays to show your work. Underneath your name, it will say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. If you don't, I take off a point. And what I do promise this test number one, by Sunday 1 p.m., I will have a graded. I'll have the final grade, the total score in Blackboard. I will also be sending out to each one of you individually your test results for each problem, how many points. Normally, if we were face to face, I'd write on there, you'd see what you did wrong. Obviously, here, take your test. Oh, that doesn't work. So that's what I'll be doing. Um, I think that covers everything. Any questions on that? Uh, Melissa, there will be time right after the lecture. I'll make time for you. That's who I am if you haven't figured that out. So just stick around. If you can't, come to my office hour tomorrow night. Today is Tuesday. Yep, I put out the garbage this morning, so it must be Tuesday. All right, here's what I'm going to do next. First of all, I'm going to do the world-famous review for the next, next test, 
test number one. I try and put all the things covered that should be on. You should know about test number one, but as the last time I checked, I don't walk on water unless it's frozen. Then even then I stay off it, which means I might forget something. I usually don't, but if I've talked about something at least twice in the lecture, it's fair game on the test. Also, I should remind you, anything we did in the lab will not be on the test. The only thing I cover in tests and stuff we do in the lecture. Also, the um, I'm just looking at chat. Uh, the um, review I'm about to do is in the lecture file of Blackboard under review test number one. One last thing, I don't think I have it posted, but in test number one, and I'll post it later today in lecture file, which will be important information, test number one, the very last page of the PDF will have important information for this one. It will be the three formulas for converting in temperature. With that, let's get going. Oh, one thing. Uh, on Thursday, after I send out the password, about every two hours until about seven or eight o'clock and Friday morning, I will check my email. So if you have any questions while you're taking the test, ask. Uh, as I always say, there's no such thing as a dumb question, and you can even ask questions during a test. I won't give you the answers, but if you have a question, let me know. Ooh, another thing before I go into review, we'll have enough time to finish everything. If you notice, we're on track because I know how to do this. But uh, over the last week and a half, I was taking the second of two courses online. One was symmetric and the other was asymmetric. And I think that's the right now is asynchronous and synchronous. I'm getting my chemistry mixed up. And they dealt with teaching online. At the other school, if you hadn't officially taught online, you have to take these courses. And one of the things the one I'm taking now and finishing up, which is asynchronous, taught me was, first of all, I have to make sure I communicate better to you. Because, just because I put it in the lecture, say it now, and also it's in the video, doesn't mean all students will catch it. So what does that mean? I'll be sending out a lot more emails with information for you just to make sure you didn't. Uh, I'll get, Sylvia, I'll get your question in a second. So if you missed it in the lecture, you'll get it then. Sometimes I might do it twice. Uh, the other thing I learned from there, which I sort of knew, but it's quite evident. I'm going to try and find out how I can do things to improve it and that's socialization. You get to see me and know who I am. I have no idea who you are. Most of you, I just see a name. And I'm going to come up with ways of socialization. If you've got a good way, let me know. I think we might do some breakout rooms later on and other things. Because normally, if you're at face-to-face -face at COD with me in the lab, you'll get to talk to your colleagues and you get to talk to me because I walk around the lab I don't just sit in the corner and do something else. So I'll be working on that. All right, I see a question. Actually, you'll be downloading it. I will ask you, try and finish up in about an hour. The reason why I'm not gonna get bent out of shape if you take more than an hour, either know it or you don't. If you don't, you could take five hours and you're not gonna get anywhere. So just try and be on your honor system. Take about an hour or so. If you need a little extra time, it's okay. Any other questions while I'm on test? And if you have any others, thank you, Silva. I love thumbs up. Do you notice? Uh, Zoom doesn't have a thumbs down. <laughs> if I were writing it, I'd have one, but nobody asked Dr. White. All right, let's get to work. You've got a test to go to. Don't forget my office hour Wednesday night. All 
All right, let's go through the review. And the first thing you should know, what are the four branches of chemistry, at least one. And don't forget, Dr. White is an organic chemist, so organic chemistry is the best. But if you want, you can put down inorganic, physical, or analytical. Also, remember I asked you to learn the 37 chemical symbols. You should know if I put down a test, here's the symbol, what's its name? You should be able to do that for just the 37, or here's the name, draw the symbol. And that you should know. Now, when we went into chapter two, remember everything you're seeing now is in the review test number one file in the lecture folder of Blackboard. I talked about the metric system and the main thing you should know are these key prefixes. You should know kilo like in kilogram or kilometer is 10 to the third. You should know milli like in milliliter is 10 to the minus three. Oh, that reminds me. Quick thing and I'll put it out in an email later today. Remember the lab that you'll hand in on Thursday and I'll be sending out the emails. Remind you, don't forget to hand in the lab Thursday. And if you haven't done one and two, get them in now. That's the other thing, because I haven't been in class. I would have reminded you this week or last week too, get the labs in and I didn't. So I'll be sending out, make sure if you haven't, and I'll this for one and two, if you haven't gotten them in yet, or one, uh, make sure and two, make sure you got them in. And for, for the density lab, instead of using a rubber stopper, remember we used the copper strip, it weighed 11.0 grams, and I'll put that in an email. All right, next key prefix, centi, 10 to the minus two, nano, 10 to the minus nine. So if I ask you what power of 10 is a milli, you should know 10 to the minus three. Next, I taught you scientific notation, how to convert a number to scientific notation. Uh, on the test, I don't think I have you going back. And you should know how to do that. Let's do an example. All right, hang on. Ah, here it's hiding. I was looking for this. It was black on a black desk. It's fun to find. All right. Write that in scientific notation. Your turn. If we're in a class, I'd say look up and smile when you're done, but give me a thumbs up. All right, hopefully you're all done. How do you write this in scientific notation? You look at the end, if there were a decimal point right there, you move it to the right of the first non-zero number. One, two, three, four. I moved it four times. So this would be 1.23. When the number is greater than 10, zeros at the end without a decimal or drop, times 10, and how many times did I move it? Four. So this would be 10 to the fourth. Why don't you try this one? Write that in scientific notation. Dr. White's going to be tough on you people today. Not really.
And for those of you who are finished quicker than others, please be patient. I try and give everybody time to finish. Come on, finish. No, I'm just kidding. All right, let's take a look at this. Notice this number is less than one. You still put the decimal point right here to the right of the first non-zero number. How many times do I have to move it? One, two, three, four, five, six. I moved this six times. So I'll do this. Now, zeros at the end where there's a decimal, you don't drop. Now, how many times did I move it? Six. When the number is less than one, n is negative. So this would be negative six. And that's how you do it. Any questions on that? How many want me to do another one? Anyone? All right. I see. Let's do another negative one because I think that's less than one. All right, do that one. Aren't you glad you have a teacher who can pop out these on the fly problems? <laughs> that's because I'm an organic chemist. <laughs> When you're done, look up and smile. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do this. First of all, this number is less than one. Giveaway is a zero in front of a decimal point. You want to move the decimal point to the right of the first non-zero number. One, two, three. So I moved it three times. Three point and all zeros after decimal. After the first non-zero number, you do not drop. Because this is less than zero, n is minus, and that would be three. Now, on a test, you don't have to show this, but here's a little point uh, tip. Throughout my career as a grad student, undergrad, I took a lot of tests. Grad school, there were some real doozies, if you know what that means. And I found if I let the paper do the thinking, I did always better. So by doing something like this on a test, well, you don't have to do it in your mind, you know, and you count it, one, two, three, and now you know. Sometimes if you just looked at like this, well, you count it wrong, and then you'll get it wrong. So also on the test, it always pays to show your work. All right, let's continue on with the review. Next thing I taught you was significant figures. And you should know how to do significant figures. Remember that on test one, two, three, four, and the final, Underneath where you put your name, it will say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And if you don't, I'll take off one point. If it's a four point problem and you did it right, but you didn't round off the proper significant figures, I take off one point. So let's look at significant figures and rounding off numbers and doing some math. We already did the problem set, but I'll do a quick review. First question, how many significant figures in that number? I'll let you have some fun. Like I said, I'm gonna work you today. The one nice thing about my reviews is I know all students who show up or watch the tape will have at least 45, 50 minutes of studying with Dr. White for test number one, which is a good thing. All right, time's up. Uh, all non-zero numbers are significant. One, two, three, four. 
therefore that's four significant figures. Try this one. How many significant figures? Oh, two threes and three threes in a row. I got to get out of my rut. Time's up. Eh, I'll give you another eight seconds. 7.2, 7.7. Time's up. All non zero numbers are significant. Zeros at the end without a decimal point are not. There's no decimal point there. So this would be two significant figures. How many significant figures does this number have? Thank you for asking, for answering. All right, let's take a look. All non-zero numbers are significant. There's a decimal point here. Zeros after decimal point are significant. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's move up here and let's do another one. Do this one. How many significant figures in that number? All right, let's take a look at this. All non-zero numbers are significant. Zeros that are confined in between two non-zero numbers are significant. Zeros at the end with a decimal point are, so the answer here, every one of those are four. Let's do one more. Why don't you try that one? How many significant figures are in that number? Looks like everybody's, this looks like a puzzler for some of you. All right, let's do it. Lead zeros are never significant. Even with a decimal. Non-zero numbers are, so the answer here would be three significant figures. Now, once you've learned that, let's do some rounding off. Round this off to two significant figures. Remember, keep your eyes on your own monitor. <laughs> uh oh, it's turning into bad humor Tuesday. All right, let's take a look at this. 
the first non-zero or first significant figure you keep. Second one you keep. Use this to round off. Four or less you drop, and two is four or less, so the answer here would be this. Round this one off to four significant figures. Just thinking about it, I have to thank again Dr. Brubaker at the other school I teach at who uh, let me know about this drawing tablet. The one I'm using for this on a Word document is called Huion uh, 1060 Pro, uh, Pro or Plus. And on Amazon, it's about $75 and it's making my life so pleasant. In fact, it's so important. I ordered a second backup about a week and a half ago. So if this one ever fails, I got a backup. All right, let's take a look at this. Keep the first non-zero number, second, third, fourth. The next number used to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? Eight is five or higher. I'm gonna drop this and everything afterward. This number in front, I'm gonna increase by one. Therefore, the correct number is this. All right, now, when you do multiplication or division, you get the same number of significant figures as the number you're multiplying or dividing that has the lowest significant figures. When you're multiplying or dividing, which you'll do a lot in this class the rest of the semester, and also hint, test one, you should know that this number of significant figures is your answer is the same as the number you're multiplying or dividing that has the fewest significant figures. By the way, four times four is 16 for those who don't know. Are they still, when you were in school, did they teach you the multiplication tables? Because I've heard they don't anymore because the kids have calculators. That's sad. My mother was an accountant. By the time I was in second grade, I was expected to add, subtract, and multiply and divide in my head and be right every time. Oh, back then, this is, I'm going to show my age. When you went to a store like Macy's, or back then it was called Marshall Field, the clerk would put down the prices on a uh, sales slip and add it up in their head. My mother, by the time I was eight, expected me and my sisters too, even though it was upside down, to add it up and make sure the clerk was right because they made mistakes. All right, four times four is 16, but this has three significant figures. One, two, three, four, five significant which is the smaller number. Hopefully I'll pick three. So how do you do that? 16.0. Trick question. Eh. When you add you get the same number of significant figures past the decimal as the number with the fewest. So why don't you try adding those together and round it off to the nearest, the correct significant figures. Remember, you get the same number of significant figures past the decimal as the number that has the fewest significant figures past the decimal.
I'll help you out for those who don't have calculators and didn't learn how to add. Let's see if Dr. White still remembers. Here's what your calculator would show, but what would be the correct answer there? Three more seconds. One, two, 2.2, 2.85, 2.93, time's up. All right, look at the first number. How many significant figures pass the decimal? One, two, three. Remember, zeros after a decimal are significant. Here, how many significant figures pass the decimal? One, two. Therefore, my answer should have two past the decimal. One, two. Use this number to round off. Is that four or less? Yes. So I'm going to drop it. And the correct answer here is this. And that's how you do significant figures rounding off and calculations. Go back and review the problem set. We can also look at the video. It's on YouTube. By the way, thank you for making me a YouTube star. Not really. All right. Once again, don't forget about the chemical symbols and their names. Dr. White likes repetition. In chapter three, matter has mass and occupies space. All right, everybody together out loud. What are the three states of matter? Solid, liquid, gas. Thank you. You should know. Solid, definite shape, definite volume. See, Dr. White got lazy. He didn't even write them down. I can do that. I'm the teacher. Uh, uh. Anyways, liquid, definite volume, indefinite shape. Gas, indefinite shape, indefinite volume. Again, three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, and you should know the definitions. I talked about physical and chemical properties. You should know some examples. Physical property, what color is that car? How does something smell like a rose? That's a chem physical property. Uh, is gasoline flammable or not? Yes, that's a chemical property. Is water flammable or not? That's a chemical property. Well, iron rust, yes, that's a chemical property. Now, when we talk about physical and chemical, we can also about how these things change. And you have physical change and chemical change. Physical change is when something changes one of its physical states, but it does not change its chemical identity. An example of that is, if you put an ice cube in a glass and come back two hours later or five, you'll see it's gone because it melted. That's a physical change. It went from a solid to liquid. If you boil water, and you, you shouldn't do this, but you come back and the pot is empty, don't because you can burn down your house. But what happens when you boil water, and I'll teach you more later in the semester, it goes from a liquid to a gas. That's a physical change. Now, a chemical change is when something changes into new chemicals, new substances. An example of that is when, and hopefully it doesn't happen on your car, the body of a car starts rusting. That's a chemical change. Also, if you look at a candle that's burning, the wax is undergoing a chemical change that's what's happening in the flame and the wet. All right, next, I talked about the chemical conversion or the temperature conversions. And that doesn't want to, all right. Why doesn't that want to go away from my screen? It's being difficult. All right, you should know do, how to use. This will be given to you. In the back of test one, Fahrenheit equals 1.8 times degree C plus 32. Celsius equals Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8. Calvin equals degree C 
plus 273. Now, some teachers do, Dr. White won't. Well, I'll never say, if the temperature is so much Fahrenheit, what is it in Kelvin? That's two conversions, guess what? I have never done that in my life and you won't, so why ask? But each one of these you should not use individually. Remember the first one, 1.8 and 32 are exact numbers. The only thing that tells you how many significant figures your answer should be is degrees C. Second one, 32 and 1.8 are exact numbers. The only thing that tells you uh, how many significant figures your answer should be is degrees F. And the last one, 273 is an uh, exact number. The only thing that tells you significant figures is degrees C. Chapter, next chapter four. We got to talk about good stuff. We talked about the atom and the atom is the smallest particle of an element that contains all the properties of that element. Then we got to talk about the neat subatomic particles. And you should know the three of them. Everybody together, electron, proton, neutron. And you should know electron has a negative charge. Proton, positive charge, neutron, no charge. Again, the three subatomic particles, electron, proton, neutron. You should know electron, negative charge, proton, positive charge, neutron, no charge. Now, you should also be familiar with Thompson's cathode ray test uh, two uh, experiment determined that an electron has a negative charge, which was quite an important discovery. And then you should also know Rutherford's gold foil experiment dealt with the nucleus of the atom, that's the center of the atom, you should know, is very dense. And you should know, hint, hint, that the nucleus contains only protons and neutrons. So you should know Thompson's cathode ray tube experiment. He discovered that the electron has a negative charge. Rutherford's gold foil experiments, nucleus at the as of the atom is very dense and the nucleus contains protons and neutrons, no electrons, they're all around. Next thing, atomic number, where we went on the periodic table and there the atomic number tells you the number of protons since all atoms have a net zero charge of elements it's also equal to the number of electrons. So if I ask you how many electrons are in helium, and I believe helium has atomic number two, it's two. How many protons, atomic number two, two. You should know that. Next, I talked about the periodic table. I talked about key groups in there, the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, the halogens, and noble gases, and hang in there while I open my periodic table. This is the one you'll download and you can use, have it open on your computer. You don't have a printer. Does everybody see the periodic table? Give me a thumbs up. Thank you. All right. The first column, lithium, sodium, potassium, alkali metals, hydrogen is not, even though it's in it. But if I ask you, give the example of an alkali metal with the chemical symbol. You could put either lithium Li, sodium Na, potassium K. If I ask you, give the example of an alkaline earth metal, magnesium or calcium. If we go all the way over to the right, second to last column, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, those are the halogens. If I ask, give an example of a halogen gas, oh, let's do iodine. You can put down iodine. And the very last one, column all the way to your right are the noble gases 
And if I ask, give an example of a noble gas with chemical symbol, you could put KR, Krypton. Remember, in our universe, Krypton is a colorless gas. It's not a green solid that kills Superman. And you should know those. All right, everybody, you see the uh, review again? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Thank you. And the last thing on there, you should know what a metal is. It's an element that has the properties of luster. You can shine it up. Thermal conductivity, it conducts heat. Electroconductivity, you can put electricity through it. And malleable means you can pound on it, make it real thin. And that's test number two, review. Remember what I just showed you is available on Blackboard in the lecture folder all the way at the bottom. Now, can I give, ask for you, how many felt this review was helpful? Give me a thumbs up. How many of you would like me to do it for the next test too? Give me a thumbs up. Guess what? I will, you don't have a choice. But anyways, now you know why I call it my world famous review, because I've been told it helps students, hopefully it'll help you. And I see a big yes with a couple of, I do that. Hint, that's one of the reasons my students do well. The other thing is they follow my advice practice. All right, how are we doing time-wise? Ah, we got a couple minutes to move on, so we shall. All right, let's look at chapter four, practice problems. Hopefully you all see it on your screen. If not, yell at me. All right, first thing you should know, how many atoms are in a certain molecule? And how do you do that? You just add them up. HCl has one hydrogen, one chlorine, two. Here, sodium sulfate, which is in the little packets that you buy like electronics or other things. Even uh, if you buy dry seaweed, I forgot what the name of that is, roasted dried seaweed. There's a name that escapes me. They put that in there too in a little packet. Do not eat as sodium sulfate. How many atoms to sodium? Remember, look at the subscript to the right of the element symbol. One sulfur, four oxygen. Now, when you have parentheses, you multiply everything inside the parentheses by the number outside subscript to the right of the parentheses. So I have one magnesium, one hydrogen, but times two is two. One carbon times two is two carbons. Three oxygen times two, oh, I did it right, six. And that's how you do it. Hopefully you all got water right too. All right, so important things I just mentioned. If I ask on a test, what's the charge on a proton? It's positive. What's the charge on an electron? Negative. And you can either write the symbol or write the name. Either one works for me. Here, how many electrons and protons does each element have? You don't have to write down the symbols like I did, but you need to look at your periodic table Let's look at carbon. Carbon is here, atomic number is six. That tells you how many electrons and protons. Oh, I got it right. By the way, that's my favorite element on the periodic table. Your skin is mainly carbon, so is what's left in my hair. But anyways, all your proteins, carbohydrates, and fats and oils, your three favorite food groups besides french fries and beer are also containing carbon. Now, if 
I come down to lead. How many electrons and protons? Lead is chemical symbol PV. If we come over to our periodic table, this is one I always forget where the hell it is. I'm going to cheat back here. Hold on. And we've come over here, it took me a while because I never ever work with this, is 82. Therefore, it has 82 electrons, 82 protons. All right, I'm going to let you try one. Sulfur, how many electrons, how many protons? Uh, time's up. Put down your pens and pencils, hand in your computer. I'm just practicing. It has chemical symbol S, 16 is its atomic number. Atomic number tells you how many protons and electrons, and the answer is 16. Next thing, as we just mentioned, give the name and chemical symbol for a halogen. Halogen second to last column. Dr. White's worked a lot with chlorine. So that's what I put down, chlorine Cl. Alkaline earth metal, you could either put down magnesium. I put down calcium because you'll learn later on. It helps to get you keep your bones straight and strong. Inert gas, I put down argon. Earlier, I put down krypton. Alkali metal, there are many choices here. One is sodium, another lithium, potassium. Give an example of a metal, gold, or you could put down iron, tin, copper. Those are all good examples. We've had a busy morning. Time flies when you're having fun with chemistry. Wow, it looks like I just started. Hold on. All right. Any questions before we take a break? Going once, going twice. I'm going to give you an extra 30 seconds. Don't tell the dean. Let's all come back at 10.55. That's when the big hand is on the 11. Or if you have a digital watch, it says 10 colon 55. And with that, I'll see you in five minutes. Dr. White's going to stretch.
All right, let me get you all back. <laughs> it's time to start again. I love that whistle. All right, now what I'll be covering will be on test two, but I have to continue on. Uh, someone, Kim just asked, is an inert gas, which sometimes I call it, the same as a noble gas? And the answer is yes, but until about 1995, which isn't that long ago, give or take a few years, the last column of the periodic table was called the inner gases. Then some very clever chemists found a way to make those react. You really have to beat on it and use very strenuous uh, ways of making it react, but he got it to react. And now because they're, you can react them, we could no longer call them inert because inert means they don't react. So they changed the name back then to noble gases. I think in honor of Alfred Nobel, but I might be wrong on that, but who knows. Uh, one day I'll look it up, but I haven't. The other things that I'll look up first, but to this day, and I've been real careful this semester, I'll sometimes say, oh, the inert gases. No, it's the noble gases now. Hopefully that answers your question. I did, you're welcome. All right, let's do a little review. From chapter five, we talked about chemical bonds. There's two types, ionic bond, covalent bond. You should know. Ionic bond is the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. Ionic bond, the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atom to another atom or group of atom. Uh-oh, look out, it's time for Dr. White to be subtle. Subtle, again, what's an ionic bond? The transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. Remember, anything you see on the screen now is available to you in Blackboard, both as a Word file, PDF, I'm in chapter five right now. For those of you writing it down, I'll give you time. Tonight at midnight, I'll be giving speed note-taking lessons. No, I won't. All right, let's move on to the next one. And that's what is a covalent bond. And the covalent bond is the sharing of one or more pairs of electrons between atoms. Again, the covalent bond is sharing one or more pair, in case you don't know, that means two electrons between atoms. I think I better be subtle again. Subtle, again, what is a covalent bond? The sharing of one or more pairs of electrons between atoms. And if you look at your skin, it's being held together by atoms in covalent bonds. So if you wonder why I smile when someone says they hate chemistry, well, if you hate chemistry, you hate the fact that the atoms of the elements are holding together by chemical bonds to form your skin and everything else you see. 
Amazing, isn't it? Yes. I skipped nomenclature. We'll do that during the semester. Skip this, skip this. Polyatomic ions, I just covered briefly. Now we'll cover it more. I will never ask you what's the definition of a polyatomic ion, but you should know poly means many, atomic actually atoms, and it's ion, so it has a charge, which I'll teach you more about. By the way, if you know anybody named Polly, don't tell them, you know, your name means many. They've heard it about a million times. A number of years ago, I was at a social event, introduced to a dean at the other school I worked at, Polly Nash, who we got to be friends, very nice lady, who unfortunately passed away a couple, about a year ago. Sad, but true, unfortunate. But anyways, I said, Polly, do you know your name means many? And she gave me that look like, you know how many times I've heard that? And then she said it, so I apologize. All right, and we talked about the key ones on here, which you don't have to memorize, but it's in your daily life. Nitrate, nitrite, also bisulfate, bicarbonate, even carbonate, and we'll learn real later on, which is very important, hydronium hydroxide know these names, but not for test number two. We'll get through them throughout the semester. And if you, I don't know if any of you are reading the book, but if you are, the parts on naming acids, oxalic acids and formula mass, I'm gonna cover later on. That was quick. And let's move on to chapter 10, chemical bonding. I think I started this already, but let's go over because review and repetition is good for your grade, which means you'll learn it, which is why you're here. So I get what I want and you get what you want. All right, what holds atoms together? Chemical bonds. And there are two types I mentioned. Ionic bond, which we just went through and you should know, results from the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atoms to another atom or group of atoms. And major additions to the pertinent material of this chapter slides have been made by me. So if you're reading the book, you'd see extra stuff. I'm not gonna even gonna charge you extra for it. All right. I also talked earlier, what's a covalent bond? and that results from the sharing of one or more pairs of electrons between atoms. Now, an important thing is valence electrons and the electron dot symbols. And a convenient way to represent valence electrons, I think it was in chapter nine at the end, Valence electrons are the outermost electrons. And the way we do it, in the book it's called electron dot, but I like to call it Lewis structures because that gives, we honor the great work Lewis did. I don't know his first name, Dr. Lewis, I'm sure he's a PhD in chemistry, came up with the concept. And it's a way to show the valence electrons of the elements. Remember valence electrons, you see the number at the top of the column of the periodic table that tells you how many. It's in Roman numerals, but since most of you never learned it, I also put the numeric number or also called Arabic number on top. And for valence electrons, the maximum is eight. Never less than one, never more than eight. And when we do a Lewis structure, it consists of an element symbol with one dot for each valence electron. You can ignore this, but valence electrons, you don't mess with the DRF, which is why I didn't earlier mess with the DRF. Now, this is very important. When you do a valence electron, 
you always place one electron on one side of the element symbol before putting a second electron on any side. So each side needs to get one electron, which we show as a dot, before you double up. I'll say it again, because it's a common mistake on test two. You should always put one on each side before you double up. So let's look at example. If I ask, draw the valence of the Lewis structure for carbon. Oh my goodness, my handwriting. My first grade teacher would be mad at me now. <laughs> and say a carbon. Well, how do you do that? Well, you got to find out how many valence electrons. Well, how do you do that? Well, let's go look at the periodic table. Everybody see a periodic table? Hopefully you do. If not, yell at me. Look for carbon. Oh, there it is, C. Look at the top. And this is a periodic table you'll be given for test two. And in case you don't know, IV is four. Notice I wrote it both in black and red case you're colorblind red, which I did have people working for me when I was in the industry twice who were colorblind red. But anyways, that's why I went back and rewrote them here. Four. So you now know carbon has four valence electrons. So what do we do? We write the chemical symbol. And then since we have four valence electrons, you put a dot on each side before you double up. And that's the Lewis structure for carbon. Remember, one dot on each side before you double up. Let's have some fun with this. Yes, you can have fun with this. Same thing, the Oh, look, my better handwriting came back. Remember, I'm on a test. Why don't you do it for oxygen? For those who don't have a periodic table, here's the periodic table. All right, for those who haven't learned it, hopefully you will for Thursday, oxygen is O. Now for test two, you need to know, look at the top, VI or the number six tells you, you have six valence electrons. I'll let you continue on on your own, draw the Lewis structure. Remember, one dot on each side before you double up. All right, give me a thumbs up when you're done. All right, let's go ahead and do it. Write the chemical symbol for the Lewis structure. Now we have six valence electrons. You put a dot on each side before you double up. Well, I got four, I got two more to do. 
six minus four is two. Now, organic chemists like to put the dots on top and bottom that way. However, if you wanted to do this, and you could also do this, and there's another way, I guess you could do this. I think I got all, all those are right. Organic chemists like to do that way, but on a test, all four of these would be correct because they're the same. But like I said, organic chemists, then I'm an organic chemist, and we do it that way. Why? It looks better. All right, oh, let's do one more. These are fun. And let me bring back the periodic table for you. Draw the Lewis structure for chlorine. Got to know what the symbol is. It's CL if you don't know. Hopefully you'll learn for Thursday. Now, first thing you have to do is find valence electrons. Remember, the atomic number gives you how many electrons and protons, but the number at the top, VII, or the number seven, tells you there's seven valence electrons. So now you have to draw the symbol. This you don't have to put down, but I am for you. See what a nice person I am. If I say that enough times, you might believe it, but really I am. All right, I think everybody's done. How do you draw the Lewis structure? Chemical symbol. I have seven valence electrons. I'll put a dot on each side, and now I'll start doubling up. That's four, that's five, that's six, that's seven. Therefore, chlorine, you would have one side with one dot and the other three sides with two dots. You could have also drawn it this way, this way, and which one am I missing? This one. By the way, that's the ugliest, baddest CL I've ever drawn. Don't look. Oh, you look. And that's how you do valence electrons. And that's the skill you should have. And we'll see later on why they're doing it. Oh, we did some of these. Oh, why don't you try argon? And I would write the name, and I'll tell you this. Argon has eight valence electrons. If you look at the top, you would see that number eight, because it's in noble gas, which has eight valence electrons. So why don't you draw the Lewis structure for argon? This one's a fun one. Now you know Dr. White's a chemist if he enjoys drawing Lewis structures. And I do. Now you can tweet out to all your friends, you know, Dr. White really is an organic chemist. All right, let's take a look at this. If we look at this, how do you draw the Lewis structure? Chemical symbol dot on each side for each valence electron. Remember, you find that by the top of the column, a periodic table. So I'll do one, two, three, four. Remember, do one on each side before you double up. Five, six, seven, eight. And that's the only structure 
because each side has two dots. And that's how you do Lewis structures. Let's move on. Now, the next slide or two, I'm not going to ask you to learn, but it's important background information. There's something called the octet rule. And the octet rule is in both ionic and covalent compounds, atoms tend to acquire, I mean, they get them, the electron configuration of the nearest noble gas. And the nearest noble gas always has eight valence electrons. I wonder why they call that the octet rule. Hmm, I don't know. Maybe it's something to do with the noble gases that have eight valence electrons. How many of you have ever seen a quartet, string quartet? That's four. A string octet, which is rare, is eight people playing. So why do we like, why does Dr. White love the valence electrons? Because valence electrons help determine important things about atoms of the elements. And certain arrangements are the most stable. They don't undergo change spontaneously. And that type of arrangement using electron configuration where N is the shell number, and that can be one, two, three, et cetera. When you have N2S, NP6, eight valence electrons, which is the same as all the noble gases, that's the most stable because they're pretty inert, but they're not totally. That's why they have to change the name. So mother nature and just the way our universe is, the most stable thing atoms try and become because it makes them happy. Bet you didn't know atoms can be sad or happy. So the atoms want to be happy. So what do they do? They gain or lose or share electrons to get an octet. And the octet rule, which I'll never ask on a test, in compound formation, in other words, making molecules like your skin, uh, the food you ate this morning for breakfast, water, in compound formation, atoms of elements lose, gain, or share electrons in such a way that their electron configuration becomes identical to that of the noble gases nearest to them in the periodic table. That means eight valence electrons, which is why it's called the octet rule, eight. Now, switches on. The last couple of slides switches off. Hold on. I better do this officially. Click, switches on. This will be on test number two material. You should know how to do. Aren't you glad? I assume you don't know how to read my mind. One member in the previous slide said atoms lose gain or share electrons. What happens if an atom loses electrons? It becomes a positive ion. An ionic bonding to transfer again one or more electrons from one group or another. When an element loses one or more electrons, an ion with a positive charge is formed. That's called a cation. How many of you are familiar with the cathode on a battery? That's the plus charge. That's because there are plus ions there. Guess what? Your batteries, like in your car or your cell phone, that's heavy duty chemistry, serious chemistry. And there are cations in your batteries, positive ions. Hmm, this is getting scary. This is my daily life. Yeah. Hi. Right. Now, an important skill you should know is what's the charge of, of what ion does a certain element form? Well, how do you do that? Let's take a look at this. I might ask,
this form. I got lazy and wrote it out. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I could have A, magnesium. Well, how do you do that? Let me show you. Now, I have it worked out here, but let's see how you actually do this. Now, magnesium, you have to look at the periodic table. So let's look at the periodic table. First thing, magnesium is Mg. How many electrons and protons does magnesium have? That's the same number as the atomic number, 12. So I'm going to go back to my sheet. On a board, this would be easier. So I have 12 protons, 12 electrons. Now it's going to change to something else. How do we figure that out? This is the key for this problem. Notice magnesium is at 12. Does it have an octet? No. It has two valence electrons and wants to get to eight. So it can do one of two things. It can either gain electrons or lose. And it will do the change that takes it to the nearest noble gas. Dr. White almost said inert. That's the old way. Bad Dr. White. Nearest noble gas, numerically. Now, you have three choices at 12. Well, actually two. Let's just make it two. It could go to 18 and gain six electrons. It's at 12. It can lose two and go to neon at 10, which is closer to 12 numerically, 18 or 10. And time's up, 10. So magnesium will want to have the same number of electrons and never changes protons as neon. Well, let's look at how we do that. Now, this will still have 12 protons. But now, because it lost two, so it has an octet, we'll have 18 electrons. Now we have to do some very tough math. What's the charge on a proton? Hopefully you learned that for test one. Positive. What's the charge on electron? Negative one. Let's do the math. Actually, this would be a zero. 12 times plus one is plus 12. Minus one times 10 is minus 10. Now, if I add these together, plus 12 minus 10, I get a plus two. Now, that's going to be the charge on magnesium. But how do we show an ion? Superscript. When it's positive, you put a plus sign and then the number of the charge. If it's one, you don't write the number one there. Here, it's like this. Now, that's the old way, which Dr. White likes. In your book, if you were reading your book, you'll probably see it this way, which Dr. White doesn't like. On the test, you can do them either way. So let's look at what we did. What ion does magnesium form? We found out how many protons and electrons. Next, we looked at the periodic table and said, what's the nearest noble gas that was neon with 10 electrons? So it will have 10 electrons. Notice the protons don't change. If you find a way to change protons easily, let me know. We'll be rich beyond my wildest dreams, which goes beyond having my own Lamborghini and Ferrari, my own fighter jets to play with, my own island in the South Pacific. It goes beyond that. It does not happen. So now we know the ion that magnesium will form will have 12 protons, 10 electrons. We know each, electro, uh, each proton is a plus one, each electron is a minus one. Do the math, add it up, get here, and this is the answers, either one of these. Oh, that was fun. Let's do another one.
like I said, today's also turning into subtle Tuesday. For those who can't read my handwriting, write the ion that the following will form. And let's take a look. The first thing you have to do is find out how many electrons and protons does sodium have. And if we come over here, we see sodium Na has 11 protons, 11 electrons. So I can go back. Remember, atomic number equals number of electrons, number of protons. It doesn't matter if you put electrons or protons on top or bottom. I switch. Now, what will it go to? Now, all this I'm writing now, you don't have to write down there, but I'm showing the thought process. Now, here's sodium at 11. It wants an octet. The same number of electrons as the nearest inert gas. And we're at 11. What's the nearest? inert gas, noble gases, I did it again. I thought I got myself cured of that. Obviously, I didn't. We got two choices, neon at 10, argon at 18. And which is closer numerically? And time's up. I hope we all pick 10 because it's only one away. So sodium wants to have the same number of electrons as neon 10. Remember, Atomic number gives you number of electrons and protons. So it wants to have 10 electrons. The protons never change. Now we have to do some serious math. What's the charge on electron? Minus one. What's the charge on a proton? Plus one. Yeah. Multiply it, minus 10 plus one, 11, meh. I think I need a break. Is it time for us to, no, I'm just kidding. Add them up, you get a plus one. So how do you show that? When it's a plus one, you just do that. And the answer, all you'd have to write down is this. Oh, let's do one more. What's the charge? What ion does calcium form? And Dr. White's going to be real cruel now. I'm going to push you off the deep end. Swim. No, go ahead and try it all on your own. Again, what ion does calcium form? I hope you're all having fun with chemistry with Dr. White. I say fun enough times, you'll believe me. For those who are finished, I ask everyone to be patient and wait because I'm giving everybody time to do it.
Again, what we're doing now won't be on Thursday's test. It'll be a couple weeks from now, test number two. Oh, if you're at a party this weekend, don't try and impress people by saying, do you want me to show you what ion calcium or form? Nah, you're going to lose friends quick. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you're done. All right, let's go ahead and do this. I think I saw a couple of thumbs up. All right, first of all, calcium. What's the chemical symbol? CA. How many electrons in calcium have? 20. 20 protons, 20 electrons. How do I know that? The atomic number tells me that. Now we have to figure out what's the nearest noble gas. I was going to say inert, but it's noble. Whoever asked me about inert and noble, you got me all messed up. Your fault. No, I'm just kidding. And you have two choices. Argon at 18 or krypton at 36, which is closer to 20 numerically. Uh, time's up. Hopefully, all picked 18. Therefore, it wants 18 electrons, but it has 20 and 20. So let's go back to our sheet. As 20 electrons, 20 protons, it wants to go to the nearest inner uh, noble gas, and that has 18 electrons. You'll still have 20 protons. Every electron has what charge? Minus one charge, negative one. Every proton has a plus one charge. Do the math. Add it up, and I get what? Plus two. So calcium forms a plus two. You can write it the older way Dr. White likes to, or you could have written the other way, which Dr. White doesn't like, but would mark correctly. All you have to put one of these on a test. The rest of this you don't have to show, but I'm showing so you know how to do it. Now, let's take a look at this. How many have heard of you have to have calcium for strong bones and teeth? So you don't get, when you get older, like Dr. White, which I don't have, thank goodness, you don't get osteoporosis, which is a serious disease, bone disease. And calcium, when they say calcium, calcium is an element. Calcium is like a metal, like my ring that's gold, but just think of it as a metal. Do you want to chew on this? No, you'll break your teeth. What they really mean when they say you need calcium for strong bones, notice I always do that. Dr. White's tough, uh, I work out too. But anyways, uh, it's not the calcium, the element, it's the calcium cation. What helps make strong bones are calcium plus two cations. How that does this, that's another course from Dr. White the last time he had biology was freshman year in high school. And that's good enough for me because by then I knew I wanted to be a chemist and I did become one. All right. So remember when they say calcium is good for strong bones, they're talking about calcium plus two. How many of you have ever gone to the supermarket 
and bought something that's fortified with calcium, like your milk. And what it is is not calcium element, because you'd see a piece of metal floating in there, that wouldn't be good. It's calcium cations. And now you know about calcium and strong bones. Now, the opposite of that is negative ions. And negative ions is when an element gains one or more electrons, and an ion with a negative charge is formed, and we call that the anion. If you're familiar with batteries, that's the negative side, which is called the anode, which gets its name from here, because at that end, you're going to have a lot of negative ions. So when you have a negative charge by gaining one or more electrons, we call that a negative ion. I'll never ask this on a test, but other classes might, so that's what I'm telling you. So we look at what ion does chlorine form? Well, you do the same thing. Let's look at the periodic table, chlorine, 17. How many electrons and protons does chlorine have? 17. What's the nearest noble gas? Well, you've got three choices. Neon at 10, argon at 18, one away, hint, and krypton at 36, which is closest numerically. Hopefully, all picked 18, one away. So it wants to get 18 electrons. So chlorine has 17 electrons, 17 protons. It wants to go chlorine with same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas, 18, but the number of protons will not change. Each electron, minus one. Each proton, plus one. Oh, that's an awful looking one, but live with it. So do the math. Negative one times 18, each electron has a negative one, so that's negative 18. Each proton is a plus one, that's plus 17. Do the math, minus one. When it's minus one, you just show the charge. You don't have to put a number. And chlorine makes a chloride ion, which it's called, and it's got a minus one charge. And what you'd have to write is this. And you don't have to show all this, but that helps you do it. Oh, let's do some of these. The question would be, what ion does oxygen form? Well, hopefully you know the chemical symbol oxygen is O. Hopefully for Thursday you do. And let's go back to our periodic table. I'm going to let you figure out first, what's the nearest noble gas to oxygen numerically? Remember, oxygen's right here in case you don't know. Now, I'm going to try something interesting. If you're up to it, why don't you try and do the rest to see what ion oxygen forms.
while you're doing that, Dr. White will tell you a secret. If I ever forget where I left off because I'm videotaping everything, I can go to the last class and look at the end. Secret. All right, let's do this. What ion does oxygen form? Well, oxygen, how many electrons and protons? The atomic number tells you eight. What's the nearest noble gas based on atomic number or numerically? Neon is 10 away, argon is 18 away, helium is two. Which is closer numerically? And time's up, hopefully you pick neon. So it has eight, it wants to go to 10 electrons. Let's look at the math, sort of. All right, oxygen has eight protons, eight electrons. It's not gonna change the number of protons, but it wants to go to 10 electrons because that's how many the nearest noble gas has. And we'll give it an octet, happy. And therefore, now we're going to do high level math. These are protons as a plus one charge to the math. I have 10 electrons. Each one has a minus one. That would be minus 10 added up minus two. Therefore, you can write it this way or this way. I like it this way because that's the older way that I'm happy with. And good habits, Dr. White doesn't change. Therefore, oxygen, when it does form an ion, will always form a minus two negative charge, otherwise known as an anion. So oxygen will always form that. Now, can you guys keep a secret? Once you know one element in a column, you know them all. If I were to ask what ion does sulfur form? Well, if you knew oxygen was a minus two, sulfur forms a minus two. We learned chlorine forms a minus one. What ion does bromine iodine or fluorine? Minus one. Come over to the periodic table. I think we did sodium. I don't think we did that, but it forms a plus one. So does lithium potassium. We did calcium as a plus two. Guess what? Magnesium does a plus two. So once you learn one element in the column, you know them all. Oh my gosh, time flies when you're having fun with Dr. White. Remember, I'll mention it Thursday. Tomorrow, sometime afternoon, I'll post test number one, PDF file on that periodic table for you to download. I also have a file, how to upload your test as a single file. If you don't have a scanner and that file, how to upload, I teach you how to do it with your cell phone. Don't give me five or eight different cell phone pictures because in that file, and I'll remind you Thursday, Dr. White reserves the right to subtract 25, up to 25 points. If you give them, don't put it, upload it as a simple, single PDF file or also a single Word document if you want. And with that, I'm out of time. If you have any questions, uh, come to my office hours. One of you will ask a question about calculator, hang around. I've got to do this because I want to. We're done for today. And with that, don't forget, hand in your lab on by Thursday. And gain gazoon, be healthy. Goodbye. I'm looking.